Well, TJ, it's been a little while since we've put one of these out. There's been a lot happen. Um, players have been added. Some have been uh, uh, released. And obviously, right after we put out our last episode, uh, the whole Cam Sutton situation broke. We didn't really get a chance to talk too much about it. He's no longer a part of the team. We don't need to talk about the legal aspect of it, but in terms of the impact on the Lions, what's your take? Well, it gives you a uh, a hole that I didn't think you obviously didn't think you were going to have going into the draft. Um, and we saw a couple moves after that that probably do direct reflection of of what happened, right? They re-signed Kendall Vildor, who yep. uh, did a nice job coming in last year. And, hey, if the guy had hands on his face, the Lions probably would have been in the Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> but, look, I, I came sudden. I think you had him really penciled in as as a starter, right? Yep. I mean, he was going to be one of your – probably your second corner um, after you got Carlton Davis. Um, so that gives you a need. I mean, does that bump up, uh, a, you know, Amik Robert, Robertson to be in your number two corner? I don't know. So I think that gives you a – bit of a different need that you have maybe going into the draft where we know still that Brad Holmes um, doesn't have to necessarily address it right away in the draft. There's still free agency. There's still a lot of free agents out there that uh, you could take the option at looking at and signing over the next month or two uh, leading into the offseason program. Um, but yeah, the Cam Sutton, you know, issue obviously you said we missed it. Um, bummer, you know, because I think he, he was a, probably going to be uh, in a, a better part position, of the game plan, yeah. you know, to, to be a, a bigger part of this defense this year, but it is what it is. And he's gone. And, uh, you know, you got to find a way to move on and, and business is business and go find a way to, to fill that void. So, um, that was one of the moves that, you know, a little bit, we, we were riding so high, right. Yeah. <laughs> From the end of the season and Hey man, everybody feeling good. And that was unfortunate, but, um, you know, you trust Brad Holmes to go out there and find some guys to hopefully fill those shoes. So let me ask you this question. Cause there's a name that everybody keeps talking about. Stefan Gilmore. Now, whether or not they're interested in him or he's interested in Detroit, we have no idea. Uh, but he hasn't signed anywhere. And I know, and in my experience, I'm sure you've seen this as well. Some guys, because they know they're, they may not be the top choice for everybody, but at, at some point, like they're the, cho- he's the top choice left. Yeah. There's still a, a good market for him. Do you expect for him to wait and say, okay, I want to see what happens in the draft? Maybe even I want to see what happens at the start of training camp, see if there's an injury. Maybe I can go help, help a team. Maybe there's a need on a team that's competing, you know, that I think could be competing for a Super Bowl. When, do you expect him to make a decision on where he's going to play next year? I think it's both sides. I think it's not only him looking and uh, look, I wouldn't be surprised if he had some standing offers on the table, um, but maybe he does want to wait until, uh, you know, the off season starts or maybe even training camp starts to say, okay, what, what am I feeling? You know, where do I want to go? What's the best fit for me? On the other side, maybe a lot of teams might be holding off on, offering some of these veteran corners deals because they want to see themselves what happens in the draft, right? We know that the cornerback class seems to be a little bit deeper than it's been in previous yeah. years. I mean, depending on what mock, uh, mock draft you look at, I mean, there's anywhere from six, seven, eight corners that could go in the first round. So maybe there's a lot of teams thinking, okay, we don't want to go spend on a veteran guy. We think we're going to get one of these guys. And then maybe after the draft, if things fall the way that uh, different than what they think, okay, now let's go to our backup option, which might be going for a guy like Stephon Gilmore. I think Xavier Howard, I think, is still out yeah. there uh, as well. A couple of veteran corners that can come in and help. But, you know, I mean, there, there's always this kind of old adage and old saying with veteran uh, players and Stefan Gilmore is certainly a veteran player um, of, you know, you, in a perfect world, you'd love to get into a new team and have a couple months to get into the system and meet the guys and kind of mesh into the locker room. But I think a lot of veteran guys would also kind of prefer, I don't, but don't I'll, bother I'll be me okay until- if I miss training camp, right? You can bring me in like week three or week four uh-huh. of training camp. And as long as I'm taking care of myself, I'm going to come in and be ready to go. Okay. So, and especially we know, I'm not trying to call them dummies, but you know, you're playing corner. I mean, man coverage is man coverage, no matter if you're right. in Detroit or Dallas or new England, <laughs> wherever you're comfortable with, which we know, uh, Aaron Glenn likes to run on this defense. So, um, it, we'll see. I, but I think, uh, uh, mostly I think it's probably the team's, um, saying, hey, let's see how the draft plays out, reassess our needs at the end of April, and then go start making some of those phone, phone calls to try to fill in the last you know, two or three spots of your roster. And, and we still have a lot more to talk about in regards to the roster, but we've heard from Brad Holmes, his approach to the draft is best available. Um, I don't know that we've talked about this in the couple of years that we've been doing this. Your thoughts on 
are you a guy that says, hey, I don't care if it's a position of need or if it's a position where we have access outside of the quarterback position, are you a best available at 29 for the Detroit Lions? And as you get down into like the third, fourth rounds, where does it shift or does it shift from best available to, all right, we want a really good player, but we also have some some areas of need. Yeah, I think there's got to be a good blend, right? The best available at a position that you – um, you know, still need maybe not even a starter, but depth. Um, and I also think it kind of depends on what kind of team you have, right? If you're a team like the Lions that we think are going to be contenders, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, I think you can afford to have more risk. You can afford to say, hey, this might be our best available player. But this guy, or I'm sorry, this might be a need that we have, but this is the best, you know, this guy can come in and help us day one, right? Maybe maybe that changes your mindset a little bit to where you're not. A couple years ago, right, the Lions had a, a, an option of picking a couple different players, um, you know, right tackle. You're starting, you're talking about a re, rebuilding team. Well, the popular thing would have been to take a quarterback there or move up and take one of the receivers that went, Jamar Chase, um, you know, or take Micah Parsons, a guy who, which yeah. obviously we know is a fantastic player, but you took a player that you needed, uh, that, that, that just that characteristic, right. Of a rebuilding type team. We need this type of person, a cornerstone guy that we can build off of for the next couple of years. Now you're at the point now, I think Brad Holmes can afford to take a couple more risks on some guys, you know, not, not necessarily having that, well, we need this or, Hey, this is the best available. It could be a blend of guys. And you go out there and say, Hey man, we're going to take a chance on this guy. And if it doesn't work out, the rest of our team is still pretty damn good. We're not relying no longer on two or three or four rookies coming in that we need to produce from day one to be a good football team. Last year, you needed that. You had four rookies step up and play big time football this year. We kind of hit on it. Our, our last podcast, they're, I don't know what what position you could draft this year that would say, oh, he's a day one starter, right? Because this roster looks pretty complete. So I think that gives you a little bit more flexibility if you're Brad Holmes to uh, not have as much pressure to say, I got to hit on this guy. He's got to be a day one starter or else our team's going to fold, right? right? This team's going to be good no matter who they end up drafting. First round, third round, second round, whatever it is. Uh, we, our, I don't think our expectations are going to change for this team. Uh, one of the departures – um, since we've last talked was Josh Reynolds. He signed a Denver two year deal. Um, does that, does that cause you any concern about the depth that receiver? Because right now you've got obviously Amon Ross St. Brown, which we know at some point this year, he's going to be extended. <clears throat> Jamison Williams now becomes your number two receiver. Um, and you could, you could label those however you want. You've got Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams, but then there's, I mean, obviously Khalif Raymond, but you've got a little bit of a drop off. How much of a need is, do the Lions have to find another productive receiver? DPJ is there as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty high, I think, right? Um, you need guys. And, and look, we also talked about, hey, Jamison Williams is expected to take a big jump, right? This is going to be his first time going into a season. I don't want to jinx it, but hopefully going into the full offseason and training camp with nothing lingering over his head, whether yeah. it being an injury or whether last year, you know, being the looming suspension. So I think the expectations for him in going into year three are, dude, you're the guy now, right? We've lost a couple players, but we need you to kind of pick up the slack and, and show us that we're going to be fine, right? The trade-off is is fair, if not better. Um, that being said, though, I, yeah, I think this is still a big uh, area of need for them. Um, DPJ, I mean, last year I don't really – expectations weren't high yeah. right coming in halfway through the season. I mean, it is difficult to kind of pick up and he made a couple nice plays at points down the stretch for this team. He, he might be a guy that can step up and take over that Josh Reynolds type role, the third down or the, uh, you know, the third receiver coming out of the uh, other side Bigger and body. getting some one-on-ones and making some plays. Uh, maybe he could be that guy, but I think wide receiver, you definitely need to look at it. And th there might be a reason too. We talked about corners kind of being a deep, uh, draft this year. Receivers seem to be uh, extremely deep in this year's draft. And I think that was a reflection on kind of the free agency period where you didn't see a whole lot of going on with the receivers. You didn't really see a whole lot of the trade movement with receivers this year, as, as we saw in the past. Um, and I think a lot of that, too, is because there really seem to be a lot of really high-end receivers in this draft, not even first-round guys, but second- and third-round guys that I think teams are looking at to say, he might be the 12th best receiver, 
but maybe last year he might have been the third best receiver, right? So we can get a guy, hope maybe in the second or third round that can come in and be a day one guy that we know we can count on. So uh, I think teams are still thinking that way as well, and which kind of, you know, and I know we're going to get into the mock drafts. We still got a couple weeks until the draft actually starts, um, but. I wouldn't be surprised if they take a receiver at 29. You know what I mean? I think yeah. that with the way that the board can go, there I think there's probably five or six receivers that might have a top 10 grade. Now, depending on how the board falls and you have other teams that reach, whether it be for quarterback, offensive lineman, defensive lineman, the premier positions, that could bounce one of those guys back to the late 20s. And maybe Brad Holmes said, look, I, I think this guy's the best, one of the 12 best players in this draft. That's a no-brainer, right? And if it comes at receiver, I wouldn't have a problem with that. So I think they're going to address it. I think you have to address it. And much like, I still think the offensive line you have to address as well. We know that the five guys, hopefully this year, are set in, right? Yeah. I think we know that. Uh, with that being said, Frank, I don't know how serious it was, but there was a little bit of read between the lines, maybe – talk there about or at least thought process of hey i gotta i gotta you know take Someday, my time to figure out what away, i want to yeah. do right so uh, we know decker's going into year nine right we know zeitler's on a one-year deal graham's going into year nine you might want to start this might be the time to start building up the depth of that offensive line to where when these guys start fading out a little bit and stepping away or maybe just hey the clock runs out we've got a guy that can step in and this team won't miss a beat. So I think receiver and I think offensive line both fit that mold of finding guys at depth positions that might not be a starter year one, but maybe year, year two, year three can step in and keep the train rolling. So a couple of guys that they do have as backups is Owosika, who we saw step in and play in the NFC Championship game, and he played he played well. Yeah, played, played um, really good. I think he's a guy that you could come in and get a couple of games out of, maybe even extended stretch if there's an injury. Uh, the other guy – is last year's fifth round pick out of William and Mary, Colby Sorsdahl. We and we saw him a little bit throughout the course of the season. What did you yeah. see from him? Do you think he has the potential this year to be a guy that they can rely upon to step in and get you out of a game? Or if they need to for a two or three game stretch, could he be a productive player at either guard position? Yeah, well, I think they obviously like what they see from him um, because usually coming in as a fifth round you know, offensive lineman from a small school, it is a big adjustment. Uh, I wasn't too far off being a fourth rounder from Eastern Michigan. <laughs> um, so, I, But I think just the fact that they had comfort, you know, not only dressing him, uh, every game last year, but also giving him a start or two and being kind of that six guy where, hey, if either guard goes out, you're going in in a highly competitive offensive line room. I think that says a lot about uh, hey, the type of player that you are, but also the belief that your coaching staff has, right? If they didn't think he was ready, he probably would have been in street clothes, you know, watching all those games. Instead, hey, he, man, he's ready, man. Anything happens, you got to go in. And this is a high profile offense, right? You're not going to put anybody out there. Um, so I think that there's uh, they they obviously uh, think that he had a pretty good rookie year, and I think I do like Colby Sorsdahl a lot. I don't think there's a chance for him necessarily to compete to be a starter this year, in yeah. case you know, unless anything happens with any of your five guys. But I think a guy like that gives you comfort that can go in and play. He played tackle in college. We didn't see him play tackle in a regular season last year. It was more guard, yeah. but I think he could truly be that sixth guy this year. Uh, there, a right tackle goes down, man, Colby, you're in. Left guard goes down, Colby, you're in, right? And you add value, right? You add versatility, that offense and that offensive line room. And then eventually, I think, you know, could be next year when maybe Zeitler <laughs> decides to <laughs> pack it in after year 12. Yeah. Then you start looking at a Colby Sorsdahl and say, okay, it's year three, man. We think he's ready, right? But I think they obviously uh, they have high expectations for him, maybe just not this year quite yet. And, and here's the other thing, too, about, you know, game day rosters. You still, you know, it, each spot is going to be poured over. You can have your five offensive linemen. I've been a part of teams where we only had seven active on game day offensive linemen. And if you have the flexibility of a Sorsdahl that can, you know, basically back up three of the five positions, because if Decker goes down, we know that, you know, uh, Sewell's going over to left tackle. We're not going to ask Sorsdahl to do that, but he could go in at right or you could go right. in at one of the guard positions, probably not at center, um, but that it allows you to have you know another guy up somewhere else where you may have injury issues or you may have yeah. some depth issues. Yeah. Um, you know, And the other one I want to talk about is Brock Wright. 
um, in that tight end position. And I want to tie a couple of our conversations together because there was a mock, and we're, we're not going to give you our predictions about who's going 29, 61, whoever, uh, for, for the Lions right now because we've got a couple more episodes to get to uh, before the draft. But Brock Wright, he was offered he, – he was tendered by um, the San Lions. Fran. Well, right. yeah, yeah. by the Lions, yeah. which allowed him to go out and seek a deal. He found one in San Francisco. It was a three-year deal worth about $12 million. And I don't know what yeah. the exact parameters or how it's structured. The The Lions took their five days. They decided, you know what? We're going to match it. Your thoughts on retaining him and what that means for the Lions. Was that a bit of a surprise for you? No. Um, it was a position that I thought maybe you could upgrade at number two spot. Um, but it wasn't a surprise because I think that you need guys like Brock right in that locker room. And I think honestly, I don't, I don't know if Dan Campbell would ever admit this. I think he sees a lot of himself in Brock, Wright. You know what I mean? Being that just kind of blue collar, uh, tight end that, you know, we're, we know you're not going to get 50 balls a year. Hell, you might get 12 passes a year, uh, but you're going to do the dirty work and you're going to do things the right way. And you're going to set a good example and you're going to be a good leader and you're going to do everything right in the weight room, in the meeting rooms and in, in, in practice. Right. And I think that Dan Campbell values that. He val- we obviously know that. They value the right type of people. They want the right type of football guys in that locker room, and I think Brock Wright fits that mold. Um, looking at the numbers, I mean, $4 million for a number two tight end, probably about market value. You know, I think a lot of tight ends now, uh, the starting tight ends, you know, we know we're making a lot more than that. Uh, backup tight end. Look, if if Samuel Porter goes down, I'm not expecting Brock Wright to step in and fill those shoes. Right. That's why I kind of said, hey, I would like to maybe see an upgrade at the tight end position to where if anything happens, you can now have another guy that it won't change the offense. The offense will change with if, without Laporta. Um, but I think you need guys like Brock Wright on this football team. So I wasn't surprised uh, at all to see them match that. And maybe that's still a position that they look at to say, hey, we can still add to that room, right? Shane uh, Zilstra is going to be coming off an injury. I think they re-sign him. James Mitchell is going to be going into year three. Yeah. Um, might have to start seeing a little bit more out of him. Um, but the Brock Wright deal... I thought they probably made the right decision by bringing him back because I think he's just one of those glue guys, one of those role players um, that might not make a big difference on the stat sheet, uh, you know, come Sunday, but probably makes a big difference the rest of the six days out of the week uh, when he's in that building and and setting the example for a lot of young guys on that team. So uh, it was good for Brock to get a good little payday, Um, you know, and I know he's really loved by a lot of his teammates, man. So it's a, it's, it's always good to kind of keep, that core group of leadership, I think, in your locker room. Well, there was there was a fun conversation that we've had here at 97-1 because of a mock that came out. And you and I both know, as soon as the draft starts, every single mock is going to be wrong. Nobody, <laughs> right. nobody yeah. has a right. But uh, in, in something that you said earlier, I think there's a long shot that this could happen. If, okay, we know quarterbacks are going to probably go one, two, three, maybe even four, depending on trades. Yeah. There could be as many as five quarterbacks taken in the first round. Shoot, there's there's been some with, with Bo Nix and Michael Penix that think there could be six. We know there's always going to be a handful of offensive linemen. Some have said, you know, eight or nine. And then you've got your corners. You mentioned, you know, there could be eight or nine corners. You've got your wide receivers, you know. so And then we haven't even talked about edge rushers. So the first round, well, you know, it, I think everybody understand or agrees that Caleb Williams is probably going one overall. I don't know that there's a consensus other than, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr., who is going to be, who is the top end talent. This is a draft that's full of really good talent, and some of those players might be great, but the mock that I'm talking about, it happened earlier, um, you know, or later in, in what are we in, April, uh, March. And it was Brock Bowers had fallen down to where the Lions were picking. They ended up not in this mock taking him, and he ended up going to the Kansas City Chiefs at 31, which I call BS on because I don't want them to have <laughs> – I want Patrick Mahomes to have another really good tight end. Yeah. Um, but if all of these other positions fill up the draft and he's not taken, I think most people at 29, if he's there, he would probably be rated – higher than anybody else. So if you're taking best available, you take Brock Bowers. But you've got Laporta. You've now signed Brock Wright to a three-year, $12 million deal. If he's there and TJ Lang is GM of the, <laughs> of the Lions, would you take him? 
Well, it depends on who else is there as well. But yeah, I think Brock Wright is probably, or I'm sorry, Bowers, I think yeah. Brock yeah, Bowers. Too, too many Brock Bowers. Yeah, that's a lot of Brocks. Um, I think Brock Bowers is a for sure top ten talent in this draft. Um, so yeah, I don't think I would hesitate unless there was a guy that I had rated maybe number nine that's also sitting there, right? right? But uh, no, because I, I don't think in this. This kind of leaded into the last question I want to ask you, which I'll ask you in a second. But I, I wouldn't have an issue with that as either because you're adding just more talent to this football right. team, right? And and there's no position of need right now that if you don't come out with in the first round, that this we're going to be sitting here thinking, oh, they didn't address this, man, we're screwed, we didn't get better. Like they're at a position now, it's almost like like picking candy, you know, just, Hey, which one do you want today? You know, we just add talent to this football team. That's the position that you're in. I wouldn't be upset if they took, if Brock Bowers were sitting there and they turned the name in. Can you imagine? I mean, uh, a guy like Brock Bowers and Sam Laporta in the yeah. offense with, with Ben Johnson and the creativity <laughs> that he could start. And then maybe, Hey, look, maybe wide receiver, which you thought was a big need now becomes a little bit lesser need, right? Because now you're thinking, Hey, we can play two tight end sets, both of these guys, Laporta and Brock Bowers, we can use as That's a de facto receivers. wide receiver anyway. Yeah. One of them can turn into wide receiver three. Maybe that affects uh, the way that you think wide receiver is on the board, right? So, uh, no, I wouldn't hesitate to because I think Brock Bowers is a, a top 10 talent. So, anytime you can add talent to this football team, you do it. Um, I'd be shocked if that happens. Yeah, I would But you never too. know. Yeah. I mean, you never know when it comes to the draft, right? And yeah. That kind of that that line of questioning kind of leads me into something I want to ask you. Is there any and look, we're not going to say kicker, punter, fullback, quarterback. You even take quarterback out, but is there any position for you in the first round of this draft that the Lions should not take? Is there any position where if they took a player there, you'd be scratching your head saying, "I don't know about that." Because for me, I'll give you my answer. I don't think there is. Well, I don't think there is. I would maybe scratch my head at a at a off the ball linebacker. But I mean, Anzalone signed a three year deal. He's going into year two. Jack Campbell is is coming off a rookie season. Derek Barnes going Derek into a contract Barnes. year. Yeah, and and so and, and obviously we know you've got Rodrigo there. Um, I, even at that, I you know as I think through it. I probably wouldn't be upset. I just don't know that there is a a linebacker that would be worthy of the 29 pick. So I that is that is it. But to your point, they've done a really good job of creating depth on this roster. They've got a really good starting unit on both sides. Um, are there positions where I'd say, yeah, there's a bigger need that that I would have rather than taking a linebacker at 29? Sure. But if it's best available and that's best available on your board, that's, that's where I go with that's other than quarterback and, and the other one, you know, punter and kicker. Um, if you have them rated as the best available and it's not even close, then you go with that because you just want more talent. You want more high end talent. And if they're rated that high yeah. to me, I'm not going to reach to take a linebacker at 29 or a corner at 29. If I think they're a second round talent, yet there's a first round talent that's sitting there and insert any name that you want. If that first round talent is there, I'm not going to reach on a guy that I think might fit the roster better over the long term because I want to just add more talent. And I got a better chance of hitting on that guy that I gave the first round grade to than I do on a second rounder because there's no sure thing. Yeah. There there there's never been a sure thing in this draft. Yeah, and I think that, you know, you don't you haven't heard a whole lot about off the ball linebackers this year. Right. Another position too. I mean, look, I mean, if they take a running back at 29, we're all going to be sitting there saying, "Nah." <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a position we might be set at, right? Um, but you always have to prepare for the doomsday, which is if the board just falls in the complete worst way possible, right? You have t- 28 guys ahead of you the top 28 guys on your board are all gone. Yeah. Right. And maybe 29 is a running an back. off the ball linebacker or a running back. Right. Do you take a chance and say, eh, but our 30th best guy is this, but there's a big drop off between these two players. Right. That's the thing where I think Brad Holmes brain uh, just is always preparing for what situation is going to come back. And look, now I know a perfect world would say, Hey, if there's nobody there, you like trade, trade back. back. Well, okay. Well, you got to have somebody to trade that wants to trade up. Right. Um, this for me, and I know we'll get into it and we'll kind of close with, with this. Uh, we'll get into it in the next couple of weeks, but 29 is a position for me that seems like it is primed for either trading up or trading back. Yeah. Right. I would not be surprised trading back, probably a little more difficult unless 
the quarterbacks start to fall and somebody wants to come and get the, you know, a Bo Nix and get the fifth year on a quarterback or Michael Penix falls, uh, which could be possible with his injury history. I know he, you know, had a good year last year at Washington, but um, you always have to, that, that seems like a spot to me where it's, it would not surprise me at all if Brad Holmes finds a way to get back into the top 20, right? And say, you know what? We can afford it because our roster is pretty set, right? Uh, we can afford to give up 29 and maybe, uh, probably it'll take a second and maybe even something else, you know, flop of force or something, right? But that wouldn't surprise me at all to see Brad Holmes maybe move up depending on how his board falls to say, hey, can I get back to 16 and take this guy? And then we're set. We might not pick again until the third round, but hey, we're, yeah. our roster is looking pretty damn good now, and we feel really damn good about this one player uh, because it does kind of feel like they might be in that position, uh, kind of what the Rams did a couple of years ago when they got a Super Bowl out of it, right? They gave up a lot, but they got a lot in return. I don't know if we're going to see that type of path in completion, but that seems like a spot to me, and we'll see a little bit over the next couple of weeks how things start to shake out and what we start to hear. I wouldn't be surprised if Brad Holmes find a way to move that pick, whether it's getting more in the back end or get, you know, trying to jump up and make one big move in the, in the front end. And we've seen him do that every year. He's been very active in trades on draft day. So, um, when we come back next week, we'll probably talk a little bit more about if he were to trade up, what were some, what would some of the targets possibly be? Um, if he were to trade back, what does that mean with hosting this in Detroit and then not having a first round pick on night one, uh, (laughs) would be somewhat ironic. Uh, and then, you know, other targets, if he does stay at 29, who we might be looking at, who could fall to the Lions. Uh, so stay tuned in here as we approach the draft coming up at the end of the month. Last Thursday of the month, this is Necessary Roughness. 